antibodies. Antibodies are also known as immunoglobulins. And they are large Y-shaped proteins produced by B cells. Now, an antibody is used by the immune system. You might have been clued in by the immunoglobulin um, alternative name. So it's used by the immune system to identify and neutralize foreign objects such as viruses and bacteria. So if you inhale or ingest something that is foreign to your system, antibodies are going to kick in and try to neutralize these foreign objects. The antibody recognizes a unique part of the foreign object called an antigen. So it's important to remember the difference between these two since antigen and antibody are both similar to each other. So the antigen is what's part of the immune system and is going to stop the foreign objects. The antigen is a specific part of that foreign object that we're going to try to neutralize. Each tip of the Y, remember we said an antibody is a Y-shaped protein. Each tip of the Y has a peritope. And think of the structure of a lock for a peritope. And each peritope will only bind to a specific epitope. And think of it like a key. So let's look at our structure over here. We've got our antibody, which is this whole Y-shaped protein. And then we've got all these antigens up here. So there are lots of different antigens that could come into your body, and this is probably not what they look like, but it's just to give you an example. If we're thinking of our antigens, and this area here is going to be our epitope, this part here that would bind, it's supposed to be considered a lock. So if this it's supposed to be considered our key. So if this is our lock here, this antigen binding site, or the peritope, then it's only going to fit with one key. A lock is only going to be unlocked with one key. You have to have the right key to get it to unlock. So we've got our antibody in each part of the Y is only going to bind to a specific antigen. The peritope, this little shape on the end of our antibody, is only going to bind to one epitope, which is located on an antigen. So that one spot on your antigen is what's going to be able to bind to the one spot on the antibody. And if you don't have the right key to go in the lock or the right lock to bind with the key, then nothing's going to happen. So there are lots of antigens, and different antibodies can attach to different ones of those. But one antibody is only going to be able to bind to one antigen. If you have lots of antibodies floating around in your body, each one is going to only be able to attach to one antigen. So you may have lots of them that can attach to one antigen and lots that can attach to another, but you can't just say, okay, well... I don't really have this antigen in my body, I have this one, so let me plug that in there. Because it's not going to fit. You have to think of it like a lock and key. So once you have this antibody produced, it's only going to be able to bind to the one antigen to neutralize it. So once the antigen and antibody bind, and remember, special epitope-peritope relationship, lock and key, it's only going to be able to bind to one specific type of antigen. Once they bind, the foreign object is tagged for attack by another part of the immune system, or it's neutralized directly. There are some antigens, some foreign objects, where if we block the antigen, then that foreign object isn't going to be able to do any more harm in your body. So the antibody can neutralize it directly. But there are other foreign objects that can't be neutralized quite so easily. So instead, there is 
um, something secreted by the antibody and it coats the foreign object and then the foreign object is tagged for attack and some other part of the immune system steps in and removes the foreign object. So now that you've seen your antibody and seen how it binds to antigens and how it can either get rid of the or neutralize the foreign objects directly or alert the attack for another part of the immune system, let's go back to the B cells. Remember, antibodies are produced by B cells. So once a B cell has been activated, once there's some foreign object in your body that the B cells know about and they say, okay, we've got to do something now, we've got to get rid of this. The B cells can turn into antibody producing cells called plasma cells. So they can produce new antibodies, um, these plasma cells that the B cells turned into, or they can be turned into memory cells that can remember an antigen and respond faster in the case of future exposure. So these B cells can produce, turn into plasma cells that produce more antibodies if needed, or they turn into memory cells. And the memory cells are going to remember the last antigen they had and they're going to be able to respond faster. So once this antibody is attached to this antigen, it's going to remember it next time and it's going to be able to respond faster. It won't have to try all of these keys to figure out which one goes in the lock. It will already know which key goes in the lock and it will be able to respond faster. So that's why if you've been sick with something before, you might not get it again, like chicken pox. Um, once you've had it, you usually don't get it again. Uh, let's see. You get a flu shot and it's got antibodies in it. Um, once your body learns how to attack that flu virus, at least that particular um, strain of flu virus, then it will be able to attack it if it comes into your body again. Now, different strains of flu virus are going to have different antigens, so it won't be able to attack every flu virus, only the ones that have that same antigen that your flu vaccine had in it. So antibodies are very helpful with maintaining your immune system and keeping you healthy or keeping any organism healthy. And the B cells produce the antibodies. The antibodies find foreign objects, find the antigen on them, and the particular epitope that it can bind to. And once they bind, that foreign object is tagged for removal. It's either going to be attacked by another part of the immune system, or it's going to be neutralized directly, and it won't be able to harm anything and will eventually get transferred out of the body. And you've got your plasma cells that are going to produce more antibodies for your body and your memory cells that are going to remember past antigens, past foreign objects that have come into your body and know how to respond to them faster in the future. So remember, antibodies are also called immunoglobulins and that will help you remember it's a part of the immune system. Remember the difference between antibody and antigen? The antibody is what is fighting the foreign object. The antigen is that specific part on the foreign object that has to be bound to to be able to attack that foreign object and get rid of it. A buffer is a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base. It is useful for reducing changes in the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution when additional hydrogen ions are removed or added. And so um, that means that it resists changes in pH. So now, say, um, if, if you were to take a look at this reaction right here, so I talked about a weak acid and its conjugate base. So we have this weak acid and its conjugate base. And so you see here, this weak acid dissociates in this reaction. Now, this reaction is at equilibrium because it has a double-headed arrow. 
meaning this reaction is moving in both directions. So not only is this weak acid dissociating um, into its principal parts, but um, the parts over here are forming back together to form that weak acid. And so say, for example, that some of this right here was added. What's going to happen is the reaction is going to shift to the left and more of this weak acid is going to be produced. Now, say for example, if this was added, it would combine with this right here, and so it would reduce the overall level of this, and so it would shift the reaction to the right. And so notice here that the buffer solution reduces the changes, and this right here that, that might occur otherwise. And so some examples of buffer systems include uh, an acetic acid with sodium acetate, uh, and another one is citric acid along with sodium cit uh, citrate. And so again, a buffer is a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base that resists changes in pH. Catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. And so the way a catalyst works is first by lowering activation energy. And it lowers the activation energy that is required for a chemical reaction to proceed. And so by lowering that activation energy, the chemical reaction can proceed more easily. Now, another way that a catalyst meets its objective is by providing a surface for molecules to come together and to bind. And so to provide a surface for molecules to, to come together to bind is uh, faster than just random collisions of reactant molecules. So that is how a catalyst meets its goal of speeding up the rate of a chemical reaction. Now we can classify catalyst as homogeneous catalyst and heterogeneous catalyst. So a homogeneous catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants. So say you have a liquid reactant and you have a liquid catalyst, then it's a homogeneous catalyst. Now a heterogeneous catalyst is just the opposite of that. The catalyst is in a different phase than the reactants are. So some examples of this would be uh, take liquid bromine, for example, and it speeds up the breakdown of liquid hydrogen peroxide into liquid water and oxygen gas. So you have liquid bromine and you have liquid hydrogen peroxide. So those are in the same phase, so that's a homogeneous catalyst. Now, take for example the combination of ethylene and hydrogen gases to make ethane gas. It's catalyzed by adding powdered nickel. So you have powdered nickel, which is in solid form, and everything else is in gas form, or, or, the, or the gas phase. So in that reaction, nickel is a heterogeneous catalyst. So an important point to remember is that catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. Today we want to go over just some of the basics of chemical reactions. Uh, we don't have time today to do this thoroughly or fully in depth, but just want to go over some of the basics of chemical reactions. So when we think about chemical reactions, one of the things we ought to think about is time scale. How rapidly or slowly do chemical reactions um, take place? And in terms of time scale, obviously we're measuring this uh, from our vantage point, from our viewpoint, so on the human time scale, the way we experience time, uh, chemical reactions can happen very rapidly, very quickly, and also very slowly. From the lower end, just fractions of a second for a chemical reaction to take place, all the way up to the upper end, years and years and years and years and years before a chemical reaction fully takes place, and everything in between. So with chemical reactions, the time scale is from fractions of a second all the way up to uh, lots of years for them to take place and everything in between. When we think about time scale, we also think reaction rates. 
What affects reaction rates? So in a chemical reaction, we need to think in terms of the frequency of the contact between uh, the chemical components that are reacting. If it uh, is very little contact, you have a slower rate. If they don't come into contact very often, that also slows it. If there's a great mixing of these things that react volatilely, you can have a very rapid reaction. So it's the frequency of contact between the interacting chemicals. The temperature plays a role. Higher temperature, lower temperature can affect uh, not only the reaction but the time rate as well. And then the properties of the chemical uh, that is interacting. Is it uh, a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Um, the shape it's in. All of these things play a part in reaction rates. Frequency, temperature, and properties. Then when we think about reaction rates, you can actually influence those rates. You can accelerate a reaction rate. This is called using a catalyst. A catalyst is introduced into that chemical reaction which greatly speeds it up. And that's the catalyst's only job is to come into uh, this interaction between these chemicals and to speed up that reaction that would ordinarily take place over a slower period of time. You rapidly increase it. But you can also decrease reaction rates and this is called using inhibitors. If you introduce an inhibitor into a chemical reaction, it slows it down. It keeps them from reacting as quickly. So you can affect reaction rates not only um, naturally and through ways that you're able to control temperature and uh, what form it's in, things like this, but you can also introduce other chemicals, catalysts to accelerate and inhibitors to decelerate the reaction times of the chemical reaction. Now chemical reactions can, when they occur, release heat, release light, electrons, ions, uh, there's usually some form of um, product from this interaction, this chemical reaction that's taken place. Uh, sometimes chemical reactions uh, send the temperature in the opposite direction, but usually it's things like heat and light, um, electrons being traded or um, spun off, um, ions, you know, radicals going off, things like this. And then finally, um, heat and other factors can influence chemical reactions and help break bonds. If you think in terms of breaking down carbon bonds, uh, this is done obviously in the uh, production of oil and related materials. You've got strong, stable carbon bonds that need to be broken down and split up. Heat is usually a thing that is primarily used to help break those bonds, divide those things up, and then sort them out to their various functions and purposes. And uh, if you ever do any sort of research or study, it's very fascinating to look at uh, an oil or a chemical plant and how they bring in the raw materials using heat and other uh, pressure and things like this to break up the raw material that's brought in into various other materials, um, sift it out and sent other places and put to other uses. It's fascinating. But anyway, chemical reactions then. Just the basic overview again. Time scale from fractions of a second to years and years and years. Reaction rates are affected by the frequency of contact, the temperature at the, uh, at the point of their mixing and their contact, and then the properties, uh, solid liquid gas, uh, the shape of it, these sorts of things. Reaction rates can be accelerated with catalysts, decreased with inhibitors. Uh, chemical reactions produce things often like heat, light, um, spinning off electrons, ions, things like this, and heat and other factors influence chemical reactions and help to break bonds. Once again, this has just been the basic overview of chemical reactions. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're at that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today, we're going to go over combustion and terms and concepts related to it. So if you look at the board behind me, we'll just start uh, at the top here. When we talk about auto ignition temperature, auto ignition temperature, when we think about auto ignition temperature, we're talking about the temperature at which a substance uh, is so hot that it just bursts into flame without need for uh, an ignition source. Um, as things get hotter and hotter, uh, most substances, though not necessarily all, have a point at which when they reach that temperature, they will, if there is um, a, an um, oxygen or other medium in which it can burn, uh, burst into flame uh, on its own without the need for uh, an external uh, source of um, combustion, heat, fire, anything like that. It just on its own, uh, spontaneously. And so it would be tied into number five here, spontaneous combustion, no source of ignition. Uh, when we think about things that don't need a source of ignition and yet burst into flame, um, we can think in terms of maybe a compost pile. Uh, as the compost pile sits there, uh, it's got hay and other things in it probably. It's strongly insulated and there's fermentation going on inside of it through the bacteria which is generating heat 
And as the heat rises because of the insulation, uh, there's nowhere for it to go. It eventually reaches a temperature at which ignition can take place without an outside source and it bursts into flames. And so sometimes people do have compost piles that go up in flames because of the um, spontaneous combustion medium, the fermentation by the bacteria raising the temperature, it's well insulated, and then boom, up it goes. When we think about combustion, we have certain types of reactions. Exothermic reactions are those that give off heat. Uh, they generate heat um, and force it out, sometimes light, sometimes noise in the form of explosions, but exothermics give off. Endothermic absorb or take in heat and these kind of reactions. So there is a heat transfer taking place here, exothermic forcing it out, endothermic pulling it in, absorbing heat inward. When we think of endothermic reactions here, you can think of these um, sports medicine instant cold packs that has a chemical reaction inside them and gets very cold very quickly. This is an endothermic reaction. So when we think about heat transfer, which is very much a part of combustion, we need to remember that what's going on is within uh, the way physics works now, a thermal equilibrium is always trying to be sought. So if there's something that's uh, warmer next to something that's colder, the general motion will be that the warmer temperature will move towards the colder temperature until these reach equilibrium. If you think here of a rod that's been superheated on one end and is room temperature on the other end, what's going to happen then uh, in conduction with this thermal transfer is the um, kinetic energy from the rapidly moving uh, molecules and atoms down here on the hot end uh, running into the colder ones transferring their heat and energy that way and so the heat moves down from the hot end towards the cold end uh, eventually reaching a place of equilibrium where this loses its heat this gains the heat and then they match so heat transfer is very much a part of combustion conduction being one of those things direct molecular transfer of heat until thermal equilibrium is reached Another form of heat transfer is uh, radiation. This is electromagnetic wave um, transfer of heat. Uh, here we need to think in terms of the sun, which gives off electromagnetic waves or radiates uh, radiation and it heats the earth. Uh, it communicates it through the medium of a vacuum space, uh, but it still arrives here in the form of heat transfer radiation uh, as it warms the earth and strikes the earth. So that would be a form of heat transfer radiation. And then convection Convection is heat transfer through a fluid medium. Now when we say fluid, we don't automatically mean liquids. The fluids are also gases. So a fluid medium is a gas or a liquid. So you can get convection currents in air as well as in water. What you have then is heat is applied to the fluid, either gas or air. And as it substance, as the fluid is uh, heated, it gets less dense and um, warmer. And so it rises causing the more dense, colder fluid then to move downward, and you get a circular motion. The, uh, if we think in terms of boiling water, you can actually watch as the, it seems to churn up from the bottom. The heat source is there, the uh, hot water becomes less dense, lighter comes to the surface, the cold water uh, sinks down, is heated, and comes up again. Uh, you can think in terms of air as well. Hot air, less dense, lighter rises, cold air, more dense, uh, heavier sinks is heated and sent around so you get these circular convection currents so these are the uh, main things to keep in mind around heat transfer conduction direct molecular radiation waves convection uh, this circular motion through a fluid medium gas or liquid we talked about spontaneous combustion in your uh, compost pile um, under auto ignition temperature and then we've got hypergolic uh, reactions here or combustion basically that's a substance when brought in to contact with another substance that immediately ignites without an ignition source necessary. It's just that type of reaction. And this is what they do in rocket engines. They have two separate substances kept uh, in different compartments and then they are injected into a third compartment at the same time. And when they meet and react, you get combustion automatically without an ignition source, which then they use to propel the rocket upwards. So hypergolic substances are those that uh, ignite or combust when brought into uh, connection with an oxidizer. So this substance brought in to an oxidizer immediately combusts and of course you get rocket explosions directed beneath the rocket which sends it up. So hypergolic combustion. Well this has just been a brief overview then of things related to combustion, some of the concepts, some of the vocabulary in, that, uh, in those concepts. If you'd like to learn more about this and related matters, if you look underneath this video there's a link down there and if you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download.
Today I want to go over briefly dehydration. Dehydration causes, signs, uh, best way to test for it and um, best treatment options in terms of dehydration. Uh, I don't personally wish dehydration on anyone. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it is not pleasant. Uh, last year, prior to Thanksgiving, I got violently ill and was unable to keep any fluids down of, of any kind. My body stopped taking in fluids. They went in, they immediately came back out. And eventually, because of the lack of intake of fluid, my kidneys shut down. I ended up in the hospital. Uh, it was very painful, not a pleasant experience. So dehydration is a bad thing. Um, you don't want to experience it. But what we talk about dehydration, we, the main cause is, of course, lack of water intake or excessive loss of water or high solute load. In my case, I had both of those, a uh, lack of fluid intake and an excessive loss of fluid because I was sick. And uh, this can be especially dangerous in children um, if they become violently ill and they have vomiting or diarrhea, uh, you can lose a great deal of fluid in a very short amount of time. So anyway, dehydration, lack of water intake, excessive loss of water, uh, it comes about due to sickness, it can come about because someone doesn't drink enough water and then they sweat a great deal, or because of their diet and other things, they have a high level of solute in their blood, a high level of things dissolved in it of uh, various types, and this can cause dehydration as the fluids get all out of balance. Signs that someone has dehydration uh, include fever, sweating, hyperventilation, rapid weight loss, decreased urine output, and in my case last year, zero output. Um, the kidneys just shut down. Poor skin turgor. Uh, skin turgor basically is if you pull up the skin on the back of your hand or behind the arm, you pull it up, tent it up, and let go. If you have good turgor, it goes back to its original place rapidly. If it goes back to its original position slowly, this is poor skin turgor. So dehydration, uh, poor skin turgor tends to be a sign of that. And then increase in the solutes. Uh, things like uh, serum uric acid lab values uh, go up and those sorts of things. Anyway, uh, the best lab assessment for dehydration is to test for uh, serum sodium. Now, normal level is 136 to 145. If it's outside of that, then you have a strong case for dehydration. Uh, the best treatment for dehydration, the best way to rehydrate the body is to take water orally by mouth or to put a 5% dextrose solution in the water. Um, in my case, my body was unable to process it, and so it had to go in intravenously. But the best way to treat dehydration is drink lots of water. So this has just been a basic overview of dehydration, its causes, its signs, best lab assessment, best treatment. And if you'd like to learn more about this and related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you should also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today, in our video, we want to go over a simple concept in physics called displacement. Uh, physics may sound scary, but it really is just the explanation and description of the way matter moves. The explanation and description of the way matter moves. So when there is a change of a piece of matter, a brick, from one location to another location, we have had what in physics is called displacement, change in location from one place to another of some matter. Um, hitting a golf ball, displacement. It starts on the tee and it ends wherever the shot ends and that movement of the ball starting on the tee and ending up out in the fairway, hopefully, in physics is called displacement. Now when we think about displacement, we can actually uh, write it out and, and uh, describe it mathematically. And this is what makes physics so great. It's a mathematical description of the motion of matter and can be very precise, which is very helpful. So displacement then is the final position of the golf ball on the fairway minus the original position with the ball on the tee. And we often talk about that in terms of, hey, he just drove the ball 280 yards. So that 280 yards is it a description of the displacement of the golf ball 280 yards down the fairway from the beginning point on the tee. Final position minus the original position, 280 yards. And when we talk about it in those terms, just the size of that displacement, the distance traveled, that is a scalar quantity. 
Scalar is magnitude or size alone. We didn't talk anything about direction. Did it go 280 yards uh, down the fairway um, straight or did it hook or did it slice? Um, did it go 500 feet straight up and then come down? Uh, we didn't talk about direction at all. We just measured the size or the magnitude. So magnitude equals size or the measurement of the displacement, 280 yards. Now when we add direction to the magnitude or size, we get what's called a vector. So the difference between vectors and scalars is the difference between having the magnitude alone or having the magnitude plus the direction. And I've got some examples here on the board that we're going to look at. If I say something was moved five meters to the right, I have both magnitude, the size, in this case the distance moved, five meters, plus the direction to the right. Five meters to the right is a vector because it has both magnitude and direction, both a distance measurement, a size, and the direction in which it went to the right. Now, if I tell you 32 degrees centigrade, all I've given you is the magnitude, the size of it alone. I haven't talked about any sort of direction of that temperature up or down. So that would just be a scalar. 32 degrees centigrade is a scalar. If I talk about um, five meters without giving you any direction, I've given you another scalar. If I talk about 256 megabytes, I've given you a scalar. I haven't given any change in direction, any change um, in, in the direction it's gone in the amount lesser or, or uh, more. All I've talked about is here magnitude, the size. Now if I say we traveled five miles north, I've just given you a vector. Magnitude, the measurement here, the size, five miles, and direction, north. And so when we think in terms of the golf ball, if I just said he drove it 285 yards, I've given you a scalar. But if I said he drove it 285 yards straight down the fairway, I've just given you a direction as well and a vector. Displacement, once again, is the main thing to take away from this video. That is the uh, movement, uh, the change in location from one place to another of matter. So the change from one location to another is called displacement. Think of a golf ball. Think of picking up and moving a box. Uh, matter moving from one place to another and displacement can be described once again it equals the final position minus the original position. Within displacement we can talk about scalars and vectors. The difference between them being that vectors also include direction whereas scalars only have magnitude. All right, well that's just been a basic overview, and I do mean basic, of the uh, very elementary concepts in physics related to displacement. And if you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, if you'll look underneath this video, there's a link down there. If you click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Most noble gases do not react with other elements. And so when we talk about noble gases, these come from the six elements in group 18, which is in the 18th column of the periodic table all the way to the right. And so these noble gases don't react with other elements, mainly because they have a full octet of valence electrons. And so these noble gases already have eight valence electrons, so they don't need to engage in chemical reactions to gain more valence electrons, so they don't have a need to. However, under some extreme conditions, some noble gases can be made to react chemically. Now, xenon, which is a larger, heavier noble gas, is more likely to enter into a chemical reaction because its ionization energy is going to be lower than those of lighter, smaller noble gases like neon. And so an ionization energy is the amount of energy that it takes to remove an, remove an electron from an atom or molecule. And so xenon has a low, a relatively low ionization energy, so it's not going to take a lot of energy for a reaction with it to take place. And so, like I said, the larger, heavier noble gases are the best candidates for engaging in chemical reactions. Now, xenon can react with fluorine to produce xenon fluorides. So that's one example of noble gas compounds. 
and then xenon can also, uh, or xenon fluorides rather, can react with water and they can produce oxygen containing xenon oxyfluorides. So they can produce xenon oxyfluorides as well as xenon oxides. So that's a look at the reasons noble gases do not react with other elements and how it occurs when they do react with other elements. Water is essential to life as we know it. And it is one of the main or the main constituent of many living things. And so there's several interesting properties of water I want to take a look at. So first is its high polarity. It has negative and positive ends. And this is due to the fact that water is made up of two hydrogen atoms and only one oxygen atom. And also hydrogen bonding. Water molecules engage in hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. Water also is cohesive. So cohesiveness means it's attracted to itself. You may have noticed this if you ever filled a cup of water up a little bit too high above the rim of the glass. Well, the water didn't immediately spill over because of cohesiveness. The water molecules were attracted to the other water molecules, so the water didn't necessarily spill out because it, the attraction was stronger than the force of gravity trying to pull it out. Then we also have adhesiveness, which means water molecules are attracted to other molecules. Water has a high specific heat, which means it resists the breaking of its hydrogen bonds and resists heat and motion. So specific heat means that it has a large amount of heat required to raise temperature by a specific amount. This also kind of goes along with high latent heat, which is the net heat change in change of state. So basically when water changes from one state to another, that means there is a lot, a lot of heat either absorbed or put off. And so net heat change means how much water was absorbed or uh, exerted to do this change of state. Now water in its solid form as ice floats in its liquid state of water. Now this is pretty odd because many times substances are denser in their solid forms, but water is strange in that its solid state floats in its liquid state. This is because when water is frozen, it expands, and so it becomes less dense because it's taking up a larger amount of space. So that same material is spread out over a larger amount of space, which means it's less dense than the liquid water. And so when anything is less dense than water, then it's going to float in that water. So that's why ice cubes float. So let's look at some of the interesting properties of water. Charles's law shows the relationship between volume and temperature. But in order for Charles's law to be correct, the pressure and the amount of gas must remain the same. They must remain constant. Charles's law can be expressed in the equation V equals K times 2, where V equals volume, K is a constant, meaning it's always the same, and T is the absolute temperature expressed in kelvins. So say the um, constant was 2, I'm just making that number up, all right, and the temperature is 5 and the volume is 10. That equation makes sense. So this is the volume, this is the constant, this is the temperature. Now say the volume is 6, well the constant is going to have to be the same because it's always the same, times T. I'm trying to figure out what temperature is going to be. Using algebra we divide both sides by 2 and T equals 3. So now, I'm just going to erase all this real quick, T equals 3. So volume went down and so did temperature. So we can see here that volume and temperature are directly related. In other words, what happens to one variable will also happen to the other. If volume decreases, temperature will decrease. If temperature decreases, volume will also decrease. And if volume increases, temperature will increase. And if temperature increases, volume will also increase. Now, I want to look at a more practical application 
of Charles's law. We can also express Charles's law like this. V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. Now look at this example problem. A 2.0 liter balloon is at a temperature of 223 Kelvin. When the balloon is heated to 323 Kelvin, what is the volume? So this is the first volume right here, so that's V1. It's at a temperature of 223, so that's T1. Then the balloon is heated to 323, so that's T2. And then what is the volume? So V2 is what we're looking for here. So we need to get V2 by itself on the side of, a, side of the equation. Now notice here that the temperature changed. It went from 223 to 323. So since volume changed, temperature also has to change here. Or excuse me, since temperature changed, volume also has to change here. So that's why we're looking for V2. And notice that temperature went from 223 to 323. So it increased. So we can also know that volume is going to increase. And we'll, we'll see that in a moment once we work this equation. So we're going to multiply both sides by T2 to get V2 by itself on the side of the equation. So then we're going to do V2 equals, all right, T2 is 323K times V1, which is 2.0 liters, then divided by T1, which is 223K. Now, I'll save you having to do all the math, so the answer is 2.90. Now we have to put the correct units on here. We can cross out the Ks. So the only thing left is the L. And that's, that should be correct because volume is always expressed in liters. It's never going to be expressed in a temperature unit. All right. And so notice here the volume was originally 2, and now it's 2 and 9 tenths. And the temperature was originally, originally 223, and now it's 323. So temperature increased. And since temperature and volume are directly related, volume also increase. Now, Charles's law makes sense because imagine a balloon filled up with molecules of a certain gas. Well, if that gas is heated up, then the molecules start moving faster. And when the molecules start moving faster, they start bumping up against the sides of the balloon more often. And they start pushing the walls of the balloon out, increasing the volume of the balloon. Now, if the balloon is cooled off, then the molecules inside start moving slower and they don't start hitting the sides of the, the wall as often. So since they're not hitting the sides of the wall as often, the walls start to come in and the volume decreases. So that's a practical application of Charles's law. So the important thing to remember is that volume and temperature are directly related. When a substance combines with oxygen and produces a large amount of energy in the form of heat and light, a combustion reaction is taking place. Oxygen can combust with compounds such as magnesium and sulfur. So here are some examples of sulfur and magnesium combustion reactions. Here we have sulfur combusting with oxygen and magnesium combusting with oxygen. In addition to the compounds that they form, they are also creating energy in the forms of heat and light. Now, for any combustion reactions to take place, they all require burning. And oxygen will always be a reactant. All these reactions have oxygen as a reaction. Because notice here, oxygen is a reactant. Oxygen is a reactant because everything on the left side of the reaction equation or the reaction process is a reactant. Now many carbon compounds such as propane, wood, and coal undergo combustion. Hydrocarbon combustion provides vast amounts of energy for home heating, industry, and making electricity. Burning hydrocarbons usually produces carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. So now we have a sample combustion reaction here. It's a hydrocarbon combustion reaction because we have a hydrocarbon right here of methane. So the reaction is taking place. We have the reactants over here, and then they form the products. And notice that one of the products is energy. And so energy consists of heat and light. 
So in addition to all of this it's creating, it's also creating heat and light. And so that makes it useful for other things like home heating, industry, and making electricity. And notice again here that we're not really losing anything. See, we had four hydrogens here. We have four hydrogens over here. We had one carbon here. We have one carbon here. We have four oxygens there, two of them here, and two of them here. So we're not losing anything, but we are creating these compounds in addition to heat and light. We can define energy as the capacity to do work. And we could further define energy as a scalar quantity. And so when I say it's a scalar quantity, that means it's kind of like mass. It has a particular number and unit associated with it, but it doesn't matter in which direction the energy was applied. Now, a unit for energy is the joule, uh, which is actually has a little j, but then when we abbreviate it, it has a capital J. So to give you an idea of the unit joule, one joule is the amount of energy used to apply a force of one newton over a distance of one meter. So notice here that it applies both force and distance to come up with one single unit. Now you may be thinking, I said this was a scalar quantity, so direction didn't matter. Well, that's true, because say you're pushing a box and you give it one newton of force, it does matter how far you pushed it, but it doesn't matter whether you push that box north, south, east, or west. So that's what we mean when we say it's a scalar quantity. It matters how hard you pushed it, but it doesn't matter in which direction you pushed it. Now some other units for energy are watts, calories, there are several British thermal units that uh, for energy, kilowatt hours, which is used specifically for electricity. Now, energy and work represent a force acting over a distance. So I'm going to say that again. It represents a force acting over a distance. And so when we think about work, we may think about just doing some, some type of physical activity or going to the place of work. Well, we have a physics definition for work, and that means to move something over a certain distance. And so if I pushed on this wall and I pushed really hard, I pushed all day, but the wall never moved, I didn't do any work by the physics definition. Now, if I were to look at a big box on the ground and think, I want to I move it across this parking lot, so I just push and push on it and slide it across the ground. Now I'm doing work because I'm moving that box. You have to move something. And so remember I said energy, or, or the unit we use for energy, which is a joule, is one newton over a distance of one meter. So we notice here that distance is important. Because if I apply a force of one newton on the box for one meter, I did quite a bit of work. But if I apply one newton of force over a distance of two meters, I'm doing even more work because it's I'm pushing it even further. And so I used more work. And so energy is the capacity to do work. It's the ability to do work. It's just like if you get a good night's rest and you eat a lot of food, then you're going to have more energy to be able to do work than if you haven't eaten anything in a while and if you're pretty sleep deprived. So you have this more energy, you have more ability to do this work. And so if I push the box, with a force of one newton over a distance of two meters, I use more energy than if I push the box with a force of one newton for only a distance of one meter. So you can see here the relationship between energy and work. Now I'm going to draw a little bit of a, a box right here to talk about the relationship between energy and mass. And so we have an equation which is E equals M with a little o C squared. So E is obviously energy. And then we have M, which is mass. But in this case, notice it has a little o, which stands for the mass of the object. And then finally, we have C squared, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum. 
So that's the way that you can relate energy to mass. So you're looking at the mass of a particular object and then you use this the speed of light in a vacuum which is going to be a constant and you're able to relate these two variables back and forth to each other. So again energy is the capacity to do work. Ionic bonds tend to form under two certain criteria and the first is ionic bonds tend to form between metals and nonmetals. So if you have two elements and one's a metal and one's a nonmetal, an ionic bond is likely to form. Now the second criteria is that ionic bonds tend to form between elements with a large difference in electronegativity. So the larger the difference in electronegativity, the better the chance ionic bonds are going to form. And so if elements meet both of these criteria, there's a very good chance they're very likely to form ionic bonds. Now, keep in mind that elements with the highest electronegativity values are in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table of elements, while those with the lowest are near the lower left-hand corner. So you have elements with low electronegativity down here and elements with high electronegativity up here. And so just by knowing those two facts right there, if you see an element on the periodic table, if you just imagine this board is the periodic table, and it's about right here, you just know by where it's geographically situated on the board that there's a really good chance that it has a high electronegativity because it's near the top right-hand corner of the periodic table. Now, I have some pairs of elements here and I want to examine these elements to see if they meet this criteria and determine whether or not they are likely to form ionic bonds. So first we have nitrogen and oxygen. Now nitrogen is a nonmetal and then oxygen is obviously a nonmetal. So they are not likely to form ionic bonds because there is not between a metal and a nonmetal. We have two nonmetals here. Then we have potassium and fluorine, and potassium is an alkali metal, and fluorine is a nonmetal. So we've met the first criteria. We have reaction here between a metal and a nonmetal. So we're doing good so far. And then there, there's um, a high electronegativity difference here, and it's actually 3.2, which is pretty high. So they're likely to form ionic bonds, specifically potassium chloride. Now here we have barium and sulfur, and barium is, an, is a metal, and then sulfur is a nonmetal. So here we have a metal, a nonmetal, we're doing good so far, so they're likely to form ionic bonds, uh, specifically barium sulfide. And then in addition to that, their electronegativity difference is moderately large at about 1.6. Now finally, we have cesium and tin. And cesium is an alkali metal. And then I'm sure you can guess that tin is a metal. So here we have two metals interacting with each other. So we, it's not between a metal and a nonmetal. So these um, cesium and tin is not likely to form ionic bonds. So notice here, the main factor here was that we had two nonmetals and two metals here. But when we have a metal and a nonmetal, they're likely to form ionic bonds, and especially if they have a high electronegativity difference. So hopefully through this short session, you have a better understanding of ionic bonds. Isotopes are atoms of the same element. They are similar but a little bit different. They have the same number of electrons and protons, so they have the same atomic number, but they have different numbers of neutrons, which gives them different atomic masses. So one way to show the different isotopes of an element is by giving the element name, putting a dash, and then giving the atomic mass. So for hydrogen 1, there is one proton, one electron, and one neutron. So the atomic number is 1 because the atomic number is the amount of protons in an atom of that element. So there's one proton, so the atomic number is one, 
and then the atomic mass is one because we see that number right there. Now for hydrogen two, there's one proton, one electron, and two neutrons. Notice the number of protons and electrons isn't changing. So the atomic number is still one. And the, the atomic mass is two. Now the third example we have is hydrogen three. Again, there's one proton and one electron. That's not gonna change, so the atomic number is still one. And then the atomic mass is going to be three. So that's three examples, different isotopes of the same element. Now isotopes of any given element are going to behave the same chemically. This happens because chemical activity is determined by the number of valence electrons, not the number of neutrons. So all isotopes of a given element have the same number of valence electrons. So they behave the same chemically. Light is the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible because of its ability to stimulate the retina. Light is absorbed and emitted by electrons, atoms, and molecules that move from one energy level to another. So an atom might release energy to move to a lower energy level, but absorb energy to move to a higher energy level. Now, visible light is between ultraviolet and infrared light on the spectrum. So it's anywhere from 380 nanometers all the way up to 760 nanometers. So 380 would correspond to the color violet, and 760 would co correspond to the color red. This is because the human brain interprets or perceives visible light as color. For example, when the entire wavelength reaches the retina, the brain perceives the color white. Now, when no part of the wavelength reaches the retina, the brain perceives the color black. Atoms and molecules can gain or lose energy only in particular discrete amounts. Therefore, they can absorb and emit light only at wavelengths that correspond to these amounts. So, using a process known as spectroscopy, these characteristic wavelengths can be used to identify substances. The periodic table is a way to systematically display the chemical elements. Now, notice I said that it consists of chemical elements and it consists of elements only. So to this, this does not include uh, mixtures and compounds because an element is basically matter in its most basic form. The periodic table positions chemical elements based upon atomic number. An atomic number is the amount of protons an atom has in its nucleus. So hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table because it has one proton in its nucleus. And then the next chemical element has more protons in its nucleus. Like I said, the periodic table arranges chemical elements very systematically. So if you were to take a look at one row on the periodic table, all the chemical elements on that one row would have the same number of electron shells. And if you were to take a look at one column, all the chemical elements in that column would have the same electron configuration. So the periodic table arranges the elements in such a way that all the elements are next to similar elements. So if a scientist knew a lot about one element, he can know a lot about the elements around it just because all the elements are grouped together with similar elements. There are about 118 elements out there, but only 114 have been officially recognized. And 98 of those are natural elements, ones that naturally occur in nature, such as potassium, nickel, and hydrogen. The other ones are synthetically produced by humans, such as Einsteinium. So the important thing to remember about the periodic table is that it consists of chemical elements and it is arranged by atomic number. I want to take a look at the properties of solutions and some different types of solutions. But first off, we need to define what a solution is. And it's a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single phase. So by homogeneous, we mean the same. In other words, you don't have two substances somewhat mixed together. They are completely mixed together, forming one substance or one solution. And they're in a single phase. In other words, they're either 
all the components of the mixture are either in liquid, solid, or gas form. They're not in different forms. So every substance in the mixture is combined together to be the same in the same phase. And in the case of a solution, the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume and the molecules do not react chemically with each other. So in any solution you have two parts, the solvent and the solute. Now like we said, a solution can be made up of two or more substances, but here we're just going to pretend that there's two substances. So we have the solvent and the solute. We have one solvent and one solute. So consider water and sugar. So the solvent here would be water, and the solute would be sugar. So the solvent is what is dissolving something and the solute is what is being dissolved. So if you were to put sugar inside water, water would be the solvent because it would dissolve the sugar and the sugar would be the solute because it's being dissolved. Now like I said earlier, when you put sugar into water, the sugar is not going to stay in there. You may go to the bottom at first, but if you stir it around, eventually the water is going to break down those, those sugar, the little pieces of sugar until the sugar is completely dissolved and the sugar is going to be distributed uniformly throughout the volume. If you were to take a teaspoon of that water, there'd be a certain amount of sugar in that water. And if you were to take another teaspoon out of that water, there'd be the same amount of sugar in that section of the water because the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume. And now notice that the water was in liquid form and the sugar was in solid form. But notice that they're in a single phase now. The sugar has become liquid form. And then we also, we said they form a homogeneous mixture. There's not some pieces of sugar in some water. The sugar has now been completely dissolved in the water, so now you just have sugar water as a whole. And then also, the water and sugar are not reacting chemically with each other. Now, there are three different kinds of solutions. Gaseous solutions, liquid solutions, and solid solutions. And now, the name associated with each kind of solutions des um, describes the phase of the solvent. So in the case of a gaseous solution, the solvent is in the gas phase. And in a liquid solution, the solvent is in the liquid phase. And then, I'm sure you're getting the picture, in a solid and solid solutions, the solvent is in the solid phase. And then the solute can be in any phase. So that's just three ways to classify a certain type of solution. But the important thing to remember, if you just take one thing away from this session, is that a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances and a single phase is what we call a solution. The three classical states of matter are solids, liquids, and gases. So first we're going to look at solids and we're going to look at some of the characteristics of a solid. So solids have a definite volume and density. So we would say they have a definite volume and density at a given temperature and pressure. So like this whiteboard, for example, is a solid. So the volume of this whiteboard isn't changing, and the density of this whiteboard isn't changing. And then the second point of a solid is it has a degree of structural rigidity and a constant shape. So notice that this whiteboard has structural rigidity and a constant shape, so the shape isn't changing. It also has a resistance to flow. Now, some solids, such as modeling clay, can flow and undergo deformation under pressure. So I'm just going to write here, there are exceptions, but for the most part, solids have a resistance to flow. Now, the second state of matter is the liquid. And like solids, at a particular temperature and pressure, it has a definite volume and density. So the reason I say at a certain temperature and pressure is because at a different temperature and a different pressure, this whiteboard may have a little bit of a different volume and a little bit of a different density. But as long as it stays at the same temperature and pressure, then it's going to stay the same. The volume and density are going to stay the same. The same thing with the liquid. Now a liquid does flow readily, so that makes it a lot different than a solid. But it does not expand to fill a container. 
So it's going to, to flow readily. If you spilled water on the ground, it wouldn't all just stack up in one spot. It would flow all over the place. Well, if you were to pour water into a glass, the water isn't going to expand to fill up that whole glass. It's going to keep the same volume. Now that's different than the third state of matter, which is a gas, because the, the main thing about a gas is that it will expand to fill a container. So all of a sudden if a gas was exposed in this room, it wouldn't all stay in one spot. It would eventually move to fill the entire room. Now the molecules are spread much farther apart and they move more rapidly and randomly than in a liquid. So basically the molecules move the slowest in a solid, they move a little faster in a liquid, and then they move the fastest in a gas. And so that's why gases are, are spread apart, it's because they're moving around so much and bumping into each other and pushing away from each other. And a liquid can, has more uh, movability to it, I guess if that's a word, it can move more because the molecules move more. And then a solid, you think about ice, it's not really doing anything, it's just sitting there because it's a solid and the molecules are moving really slowly. And so a gas is far more dispersed than even a liquid because it'll expand to fill an entire container. And so that's a look at the three states of matter. Titration is a technique to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. So this unknown solution is usually going to be an acid or a base. And so titration isn't the name of a chemical or anything. It's just this process we're using or this technique in order to determine the concentration of this unknown solution. So there are some solutions out there which we call a standard solution, which we know what that solution is. We know the chemical makeup of it. So we take known volumes of the standard solution and we add those to the unknown solution. Now, while the volumes of the standard solution are being added to the unknown solution, it's important to measure the pH of the solution. Because eventually the standard solution is going to neutralize the unknown solution. Okay, so it's eventually going to neutralize that unknown solution. And when that happens, the pH of the unknown will change rapidly. So we call this the endpoint of titration. So this is the endpoint of this technique we were using because the standard solution neutralizes the unknown solution. And so at that point, the pH of the unknown is changing rapidly. So that signals the endpoint of titration. It signals that this process, this technique, is over. And so by knowing the amount of standard added to reach the endpoint, remember we said we're going to add known volumes. So because we know the amount of standard added to reach the endpoint, the moles of the unknown neutralized can be calculated. So the moles of the unknown neutralized and the volume of the unknown help us determine the concentration of the unknown. So if you had trouble following me with me on that last part, I'll go through it again. So we know the amount of standard added to reach the endpoint. And so because of that, we can calculate the moles of the unknown neutralized. So then we take the moles of the unknown neutralized along with the volume of the unknown, and we can determine the concentration of the unknown. So that's how the titration technique is used to determine the concentration of an unknown solution.